Have you ever played a game so glitchy that some of those glitches actually end up being useful and they are the main reason why you're playing that game to begin with? For me, Pokemon Red and Blue are those games. I loved playing these games casually as a kid, but I honestly might like them more now because of things like the Mew glitch and Missing No. I spent 40 in-game hours with the game seeing if I can get all 151 Pokemon on a single cartridge. Basically, I'm just lazy and didn't want to get my blue version out of retirement. I played Pokemon Red version, I used the Dodrio Tower and Pokemon Stadium 2 to speed things up a bit. We all know the basic song and dance by this point, right? After Professor Oak dragged me from the grass outside, I decided to pick Charmander this time around, but I gave serious consideration to Bulbasaur. I decided to pick up Nidoran because I didn't want to get poisoned in Viridian Forest. I also picked up a Weedle and Pikachu, but then Brock actually posed a decent problem. None of my Pokemon do a lot of damage to him. I also decided to pick up Magikarp from that Shady Man before Mount Moon. But yeah, everything up to Cerulean City is pretty basic stuff. Let's just get right to the Mew Glitch. After taking on my rival in the Nugget Bridge, people, I made my way upward and took a left. I purposely didn't fight this trainer here because we need him. Now I gotta grind a bit and fight an Abra. This is because it knows Teleport. After catching Abra, I head back to the PC to pick him up, and now the fun begins. Now I move down to hit the start button right before my character gets into place. I use Abra to teleport back to the Pokemon Center in Cerulean City. Before teleporting, the trainer sees me, as evident by the exclamation point above his head. In this state, the player can't interact with objects and he can't pause the game. I decided to fight this first swimmer here, who has a Goldeen and a level 16 shoulder as his last Pokemon. After beating him, I head up Nugget Bridge, where I get a message about Team Rocket. After closing the dialogue... I find a wild level 7 Mew. It's a little annoying to catch, but that's to be expected because it's a legendary after all. It's basically a tradition to add Mew to my party at this point. I think that it's so neat that he's even in the game. Supposedly, he was a literal last minute addition by Shigeki Moritomo when he found out that there was 300 bytes left on the game's cartridge. Apparently, he had a Mew after the debugging stage, which I find to be absolutely hilarious and interesting. He created Mew, including its pixel art, Cry, and Pokedex entry only two weeks before development ended. I find stories like this to be wild, and I'm so thankful that Mew is in this game. Anyway, this happens because that shelter's special stat was 21, and that is Mew's index number. All Pokemon have an unseen index number, which is used to identify them in the game's ROM. The fight after that, I found a level 7 Staryu, which is because the level 19 Goldie that I fought had a special stat of 27. Other interesting Pokemon such as Cubone show up before I decided to fight Misty. I actually think that Misty is a pretty hard early game gym leader. Starmie is a pretty powerful Pokemon. Pokemon and Bubble Bean beats a decent amount of Pokemon on my team. My winning strat was to poison it, have Magikarp tank a few turns, then transform with Mew to gain resistance to Bubble Beam. It was a fun idea and I felt big brain when it worked out so well. I decided to do the Mew glitch with Misty and I got Missing No. I caught it and it messed up my sprites. It did something else interesting. When one encounters Missing No, the item in their 6th slot will duplicate. The item that happened to be in the 6th slot at the time was the TM for Bubble Beam, so I decided to teach it to everyone that can learn it. I love how this guy knows two water guns, as well as one sky attack. It's such a funny move set. I didn't really use it at all in fear that it might hurt my save file, but I think Missing No is pretty harmless. I'm pretty sure M, Missing No's cousin, is the one that can do unspeakable things to the save file. All that Missing No does is mess with the game's sprites until the player resets it, and messes up with the Hall of Fame. Now that Missy is defeated, I gotta go up and defeat all these trainers up here and make my way to Bill. On my way there, I saw some interesting Pokemon with the glitch, such as Lapras, Gengar, Scyther, and another Mew. The big one here is Gengar, because this gets me one-fourth of the way done with the trading Pokemon. Pokemon. Now it's a good time to mention that Pokemon Red and Blue have different Pokemon that are exclusive to each version, so I have to be on the lookout for the Pokemon Blue exclusives. I also found a Chansey, but the box was full. So I decided to reset the game. The dialogue still came up when I went up Nugget Bridge, but I guess the Pokemon special stat was wiped from the game's memory when I restarted it, meaning that I missed out on the Chansey. Nothing too special happens between now and the SSN, except for Magikarp evolving. Thank God. I also ran into a level 80 Starmie that made me shit my pants. I was ready to get a game over right there. Not too long after that, I found a Gyarados with the glitch anyway. God damn it. I spent all that time evolving Magikarp for no reason. I also lost on the SSN after getting cut. I love that stupid truck right next to here that caused so many rumors back in the day. Moving on to the Vermilion Gym, that trash can puzzle is still incredibly stupid. Who the hell thought this would be a fun idea? To make matters worse, I can't do the Mew glitch in here because the gym is behind a cut tree, and I can't access my menu during the glitch. I go through Diglett Tunnel and grab Flash. I also grab Mr. Mime because I don't want to go out there again. I stupidly realize I traded my Teleport Pokemon away. So I had to grind for another one to get the glitch going again. This next section actually doesn't work too well with the Mew glitch either. I went to the right of Cerulean City to find another tree that I had to hack down. There's not too much to note about Rock Tunnel either except... 
Jesus, I don't remember the encounter rate being so damn high. I swear, every couple of steps triggers another encounter, and it just gets annoying. After getting out of Rock Tunnel, I head to the left and proceed to set up the glitch with this old man here. There are numerous spots where the glitch works, not just the guy near the Nugget Bridge. Basically, it has to be a trainer that sees the player as soon as the trainer is visible on the screen. I head to Celadon City and get Fly. This is huge because wandering all over the place after teleporting is a huge pain in the ass. Luckily, I find a chance to using the old guy on the route to the right of Lavender Town. Not too long after, I found a Blastoise. This is pretty sick, but for the sake of getting all Pokemon, this really doesn't do much for me because I need both Squirtle and Wartortle still. After a bit, I headed to Lavender Town and fought my rival. Charmeleon embarrasses itself and gets absolutely destroyed by Execute. I've always hated Charmeleon. He is so goddamn weak and getting it to level 36 is always horrible. I realized that I was still in the Mew Glitch, but before flying back to Cerulean, I accidentally fought a ghost. I was really worried that this would mess up the glitch, but instead... I got a Magmar! This is huge because Magmar is a Pokemon Blue exclusive. Anyway, I figured now there's a good time to grab Eevee and beat Erica. This is another gym behind a tree, so the glitch won't work here. I used Charmeleon for the whole thing because I really wanted this asshat to evolve. Unfortunately, we stopped short at level 34. I decided to head into the Team Rocket hideout underneath the game quarter next. I then find a Pinsir, which is another Pokemon Blue version exclusive. I also find a couple of missing nose, which is nice because I stocked up on a whole lot of good TMs at this point, such as Thunderbolt, Ice Beam, and Body Slam. Whoever says Gen 5 introduced reusable TMs first must not know what they're talking about. Anyway, we beat Giovanni, get the Self Scope, and complete the Lavender Tower. By the way, a lot of these ghost Pokemon gave me missing no. There were a couple other good finds in here, like a level 7 Magneton, but not much else. I decided to go to the Fighting Dojo next because I wanted him on Lee to be a part of my team. There's nothing too special about him or anything, I've just never had one before. Some cool finds with a glitch here, like Psyduck, Mr. Mime, and Electabuzz. I didn't take him on Lee at first because I wanted to make sure that I'd see him on chance somewhere along the line with the glitch before screwing myself out of him. Charmeleon finally evolves into Charizard as I finish up the Lavender Tower and get the Poke Flute. I go and wake up Snorlax, and it's time to hit Cycling Road. Cycling Road gets me several great encounters. The first one was Hitmonchan, which in turn let me pick up Hitmonlane for the Fighting Dojo. Another biker with a level 31 Weezing gave me a Dragonite. This is nice because I can save rare candies at the end of the run when I'm trying to get a Pokemon that required me to level them up. Now I can move on to Fuchsia City and challenge Koga's Gym. Unfortunately, I found nothing too good in Koga's Gym besides an Omanite. This was very clutch because I picked Kabuto's Fossil. I decided to mess around with the route to the right of Fuchsia City and found a Ditto. This got me thinking a little bit. I remember back to when I missed that chance because of the full Pokemon box. When I went up to Nugget Bridge, the start menu still opened up, meaning that the Mew Glitch was still in effect somehow. No wild Pokemon appeared because no opponent Pokemon was stored in the game's memory due to me resetting it. So I decided to save before running into Staryu. I already have a Staryu, so I decided to reset the game again. I got into a fight with a level 8 Rattata and headed up the bridge again. The glitch worked and I found a level 7 Exeggutor. This was a major discovery that made the rest of this possible. We know that the wild Pokemon that appears is tied to the opponent's Pokemon special. When Ditto transforms, it takes your Pokemon stats, including their special. So if I fight a trainer and I didn't like the resulting Pokemon, I can always just save the game before the encounter, check my Pokemon special, look at the list of Generation 1 Pokemon index numbers on Bulbapedia, then have Ditto transform into my Pokemon. I've heard of people using Ditto with this glitch before, but I didn't know that you could save during the glitch and keep it active. If all else fails, I could still run into a random wild Pokemon and I may get something cool. Now I decided to head to the Safari Zone to get Surf and Strength, and I have a little tangent here. I hit the Safari Zone with a passion. Thematically, it's neat, but mechanically, it is total dog shit. Why, yes, I love how Tauros has only 4% chance to appear, and I love even more how I could choose to try to catch it and have it run away, throw a rock at it and have it run away, throw some bait at it or have it run away, or just run away myself. I personally just don't think it's fun to have some Pokemon exclusively appear in it. If this was supplemental, I wouldn't mind as much. I know it's an unpopular opinion, but I'm actually happy that they removed the Safari Zone in Gen 2. Now we fight Koga. This has to be one of the easiest gym leaders in Pokemon history. Poison was such a bad type in Gen 1 with all the Psychic and Ground type moves being thrown around. After getting a few lame encounters, I decided to abuse Ditto a bit. I took a quick look at all my Pokemon special stats and I noticed that Nido King was the best candidate. He had a special of 74, which is Kuno's index number. Because of this, I ran into Ditto, let it transform into Nido King, then went up the Nugget Bridge and found a level 7 Articuno. This thing was a bitch to catch. I used my level 8 Mew to weaken it a bit before catching it. Now I surfed my way to Cinnabar Island to set up other amazing glitches. 
The reason why I ranted about the Safari Zone earlier is that I wanted to add Tauros to my team. After reaching Cinnabar, I headed back to the Safari Zone. Then I talked to the old man and started surfing on the edge of Cinnabar. For whatever reason, these coast tiles will make odd Pokemon spawn. These Pokemon will be the same ones that you found in the most recent place that you visited. I was able to find a catch Tauros, completing my team. For my team, I decided on two staples, Mew and Charizard, two Pokemon that I've tinkered around with in the past but don't have often in Nidoking and Gyarados, and lastly, Hitman Lee and Tauros were completely new Pokemon for me. This gave the game a nice balance between a fresh new experience and a good old reliable one. With my team of six all ready to go, now I tackle the Pokemon Mansion. Speaking of that, I decided to not do the Mew glitch at all in this part because I think this, this part of the game kind of sucks and I wanted to get it over with ASAP. I also decided to go over to the power plant and get that done. I know that I can use the glitch to get a Zapdos, but I really wanted the one that was at level 50. Luckily, Needle King froze in turn 1 with Ice Beam, trivializing the fight. I caught it effortlessly, and after that, I went back to the Pokemon Mansion, got the secret key, and went to Blaine's Gym. Again, the glitch can't take effect here because these trainers don't run up to the player. The player themselves have to initiate the fight by going up to them and interacting with them. I love this question about Tombstoner. Like, what the hell is that? Tauros takes down Blaine all by himself because Blaine is an absolute joke of a gym leader. Now we head to Saffron City to remove Team Rocket from the Silphco building. Before that, I decided to use the Mew glitch a little bit. Using Ditto, of course. I decided to take a look at my Pokemon stats and noticed that Mew's special is 104. This is Jolteon's index number, which is extremely helpful because the player only gets one Eevee in the entire game, and he has three evolutions. I also ran into an Ivysaur at some point, but the stupid ass box system prevented me from getting it. It doesn't matter too much because I need Bulbasaur too. I'm still bitch about it because it's a flawed system. Using Ditto, I was able to copy Gyarados' special, which was 102, and get another Eevee. All the Eevee Lucians will be taken care of. I also ran into a Moltres by using my Toro special stat as 73, but I could not catch this bastard. I went through so many damn Ultra Balls and Great Balls before giving in. Sometimes all it takes is a good old fashioned second try. I made another Ditto copy of Tauros and made another Moltres appear. Looking at the index list, I decided to use a Calcium and Tauros to get Articuno, but it unfortunately raised its special by two. The result now is Zapdos, which is a bit frustrating because I already went through the effort of getting the one in the power plan. I thought that having a level 7 Zapdos would be fun, so I still went for it. This next one is huge. I decided to use another Calcium and Tauros, which raised its special to 77, which enabled me to catch a Meowth. Meowth is a Pokemon that is exclusive to Pokemon Blue, so now there are only a few more Pokemon Blue exclusives to go. I also found a Dragonair at some point before Silph Go 2, but this doesn't matter that much because I need Dragonair first. It was also level 9 because the opposing Charger used Swords Dance and raised its attack stage by 2. Does anyone else think that Silph Co. kinda sucks? It's annoying to get around, the card key takes up another item slot, and the Pokemon that Team Rocket had are all weak shitheads. As much as I like Team Rocket thematically, due to their lower levels, it almost feels like padding. At least we run into our rival here, who can be tough if one doesn't expect him. We also get a free Lapras, as well as the Master Ball. It all ends with Giovanni. He has a mix of genuinely good Pokemon, like Kangaskhan and Nidoqueen, and Pokemon that sucks such as Rhyhorn and Nidorino. Up next is the Psychic Gym in Saffron City. As far as the glitch goes, I found some cool Pokemon like Obanite. I also abused the Ditto glitch again to find Kabutops because I'm lazy and don't want to level up Kabuto myself. Finding a second Poliwag was also nice because you need a second Poliwhirl to trade to an NPC to get Jinx. I also found a Seedra abusing the Mew glitch because again, I'm lazy and don't want to level up horsey. The fight against Sabrina is kind of a joke. Tauros takes out Alakazam with a single stomp attack. Mr. Mime goes down to a single body slam. Venomoth survives a body slam and retaliates with a scary base power of 20 leech life. Lastly, Alakazam goes down to just two body slams. Were older Pokemon games being harder just a myth? Misty gave me an issue or two at the beginning of the game, but that's been mostly it for the entire game. After all of this, we can move on to the 8th gym. One of the black belts in here gave me a golem with the Mew glitch. This is nice because it's one of the four Pokemon that the player needs to get by trading. I already got a Gengar earlier, so now there are only two left. Onto the fight itself. Giovanni is a ground-type gym leader who uses Rhyhorn first. The next Pokemon, Dugtrio, gets knocked out by Himonlee easily. He also uses the Nido Duo, which I think is a very nice touch. He ends it off with a Rhydon. It's actually a decent team for a ground-type theme. Rhyhorn should be replaced by Golem, though. Otherwise, it's pretty perfect. Now we head on toward the Elite Four. We can stop by our rival, who actually has Pokemon that are around my level. Too bad most of the Pokemon themselves kinda suck, though. I just used Swords Dance with my Charizard, and he took out all of this Pokemon effortlessly. Besides his Blastoise, who landed a Hydro Pump. That'll do Charizard in. I know it's kinda pointless and time-consuming, but I kinda like the process of heading toward Victory Road and having the officials check the player's badges one by one. It almost gives a feeling that something truly epic is ahead. Something that will test the player's skills. I'm honestly shocked by how easy Victory Road is. I remember this being one long-ass cave that had tons of powerful wild Pokemon and trainers when I was younger. 
That simply is not the case. The traders themselves aren't even mandatory. You can skip all of them. I decided to leave them off in the Mew glitch until I realized that they were all behind obstacles that I needed HMs for anyway. And for the tough wild Pokemon that appear here, it's a bunch of shitty Pokemon like Geodude, Onyx, Zubat, Machop. A water type Pokemon with an ice type move for good measure will take out most of these things effortlessly. The only few things to note here are the fact that strength needs to be used here to solve a couple of boulder puzzles. If the player pushes a boulder onto a switch, a new pathway will be opened. They can also push boulders through holes in the ground and have the boulder show up on a different level. This is only one of the three locations where strength is needed. The other two are in Sifo Islands and the Warden's House. Anyway, I decided to catch Moltres here too, because I wanted the one at level 50, damn it. What an underwhelming final cave before the Elite Four. Now it's time. I thought about grinding for a bit because I felt like I was underleveled, but then I realized that it will take ages with the horrible Pokemon that are found in Victory Road. Up first is Lorelei. Hitmonlee defeats Dugon easily, as well as Cloyster. I decided to use Meditate because Solobro kept spamming Amnesia due to what the developers call Smart AI. You see, Amnesia is a Psychic type move, and Hitmonlee is a Fighting type Pokemon. So naturally, Amnesia is the right move to use here. Right? This is because Psychic beats Fighting! The game seems to think so. Anyway, Hitmonlee proceeded to set up and defeat Lorelei on his own. Bruno was up next, and the League ought to be embarrassed for letting this guy be a member. He is literal dog shit that poses no threat whatsoever. Gyarados takes him down single-handedly. He specializes in rock and fighting types, so he'll be ready to face awful Pokemon like Hitmonchan, Onix, Hitmonlee, and another Onix for some reason. On to Agatha. Agatha specializes in... Ghost or Poison types, I guess? The game makes you want to believe that she specializes in Ghost types, but why the hell is Arbok and Golbat here? Needle King is able to solo Agatha with his diverse move pool. He has Earthquake for both Gengars, Arbok, and Haunter, and he can also take out Golbat with Rock Slide and Thunderbolt. That is really all that there is to this fight. Now we can move on to Lance. I won't lie, Lance actually gave me a bit of trouble here. I decided to leave the Gyarados because I can just use Thunderbolt's Garrett of his Gyarados. I used Ice Beam on his Dragon Air, however, I didn't knock it out in one hit. It responded with a Hyper Beam that critted Gyarados and knocked it out. I threw in Tauros just for him to get hit by another critical hit Hyper Beam on the next Dragon Air. I sent out Mew to finish it off and fight Aerodactyl, but then it got hit by a critical hit takedown. Charizard finished it with ease until Dragon Egg came out and destroyed it. Then I sent out Hitmonlee, which locked Lance into agility because of his smart AI. On to the champion. Tauros tanks a sky attack from Pidgeot, and then he gets destroyed by Alakazam. Gyarados takes both it and Rhydon out, as well as Arcanine. I don't know why he put in a rock and ground type, followed by a fire type against my water type, but go off, I guess. Exeggutor then gets frozen solid by my ice beam. Mew then finishes off Blastoise, meaning that I am the champion. All of my Pokemon get entered to the Hall of Fame, and I decided to go tackle Cerulean Cave. Some fearsome Pokemon are kept away in here, such as Dodrio, Raichu, Rhydon, and Chansey. In general, the cave is kind of a pain to get through as it's a giant maze. Combine that with the fact that you encounter a Pokemon every few steps, it gets annoying pretty quickly. At times like this, I am truly thankful that I'm playing four times the speed. In the end, the players awarded Mewtwo, easily the best Pokemon in Gen 1. And honestly, it may very well be the most busted Pokemon ever. Seeing how it's at level 70, I wasn't messing around with that shit. I'll just use one of my clone Master Balls. I'm not nearly done with the game, though. I was sitting at 104 Pokemon out of 151. What's worse, I'm still missing out on several Pokemon that are only in Pokemon Blue, such as Sandshrew, Vulpix, and Bellsprout. That's not to mention other Pokemon that you can't get due to the game giving the player the choice of one or the other. Bulbasaur and Squirtle are two Pokemon that never appeared to me. I didn't come across Machamp or Alakazam either. This is when I needed to start getting crafty. Otherwise, I'd have to drag my blue version copy out of retirement. I decided to take a quick look at all the Pokemon that I still needed. Seeing how Bulbasaur is number one of the Pokedex, I thought it was a good place to start. I decided to give my Mew rare candies and calcium until I had exactly 153 special. Then I set up the Mew glitch, found a Ditto, and encountered a Bulbasaur. I then leveled Mew up to make sure this special was 170 because this is how I'll encounter Porygon. I'm sorry, even at quadruple speed, buying coins is so needlessly tedious and time consuming. So I set up the glitch, fought another trainer, and found a Porygon. Because I have Pokemon Red version, Porygon costs 9,999 coins instead of only the 6,500 which it costs in Pokemon Blue version. I don't know why they did that. I leveled up Mew to get a special to 176 for Charmander, but I unfortunately overshot it and ended up having a special of 177. It's not the end of the world as that is Squirtle's index number, but it is a bit annoying. After catching Squirtle, I leveled up Mew to have a special stat of 188 so I can get a Bellsprout. Bellsprout's family is actually the last index numbers that are occupied by Pokemon, so this ends Mew's effectiveness for the glitch. 
Saint Shrew is up next. His index number is 96, so I decided to use my Needle King. I leveled him up to find a Sand Shrew and caught it. Vulpix is an index number of 82. My Pokemon are too strong at this point to hit that. Besides him on Lee, who has such shit special that I don't want to take the time to level him up, I grabbed a Venonoff out of the box and did the glitch with it, and found a Vulpix. All the Pokemon that are exclusive to Pokemon Blue are accounted for. Next, I get my Gyarados special to 149 so I can get an Alakazam without trading to another version. I then leveled up Charizard to get his special to 126. This will ensure that I find him a champ. With that, all of the trading Pokemon are now done. My Pokedex is now at 112. But the big news here is this. I have all the Pokemon that I need. I have all the, in quotes, choice Pokemon covered, like Eeveelutions, Fossils, and Starters. All Pokemon Blue exclusive Pokemon are here, and all the trade Pokemon. The rest of this now is just me sitting here, using rare candies on Pokemon to level them up. There were a couple of oddies, like I somehow forgot Kangaskhan, and funnily enough, my last two Pokemon were Krabby and Kingler because I totally forgot about their existence. I was sitting at 149 for a while before caving and looking them up. At 38 hours and 36 minutes, I got all 151 Pokemon without needing another version. It is something that I've only done in modded games like Pokemon Crystal Clear. I went to Celadon City to receive my diploma. There's one final thing that I gotta do before ending this. I buffed up all my Pokemon to level 100 with rare candies, shoved vitamins down their throats, taught them all the moves that I wanted them to know, and registered them into Pokemon Stadium. With all that done, I completed Pokemon Red once more. So now that I'm done with my adventure, there are some negatives that I have to point out in this game, as much as I enjoyed it. The item inventory is absolutely abysmal. I'm a loser and want to have all 50 TMs in my inventory. That's literally impossible. There are only 30 item slots in the player's PC and 20 in the player's pocket. Seeing how you need HMs to get some TMs, and that's not to mention all the stupid key items that you use only once or twice, this simply is not feasible. Even if you forget about me wanting all the damn TMs, I'm constantly chucking items to make room for new ones. There are also health items, PP items, vitamins, evolution items, repels, Pokeballs. 50 item spaces simply are not enough for a game like this. A tangent similar to that would be the fact that quality of life features simply aren't there. Generation 2 simply made huge strides in that regard. Did you know that there is no way to check how powerful and accurate moves are? Even for a walking Pokemon encyclopedia like me, this can still pose a problem because moves have changed over time. Like, did you know that Rock Throw has only 65% accuracy in Generation 1? Who the hell was responsible for that? Did you know that Wing Attack is only 35 power instead of 60? When a Pokemon learns a move by leveling up, or hell, even when one boots up a TM, there is no way to see how good it is. That is simply mind-boggling to me. Imagine booting up the TM Razor Wind for the first time. This move sounds badass! Until you hear that it's not strong, it's not accurate, it's a normal type move, and it takes two turns. Why the hell is this a move, let alone a TM? Speaking of moves, Pokemon movesets are also odd in this game. I love my Pinsir who can learn any bug type moves. I love my Gyarados that can't learn any flying type moves. I love my Hitmonlee who can only learn normal and fighting techniques, making it completely useless against ghost types. I love how Psychic has only one weakness, and it's fringe at best. I love how Dragon has literally a single attack, and it's fixed at 40 damage. I get it's the first generation at all, but some of this type balance is pretty damn bad. I'd argue that those are the big ones, but there's still a lot of the little annoying ones that keep adding onto it. Having to go into the Pokemon menu to use HMs is kind of annoying. The fact that there is no indication of what has caught a Pokemon species while in battle, in a game that centralizes around catching them all, is such an oversight. The box system is pretty clunky and not so great to use, and the fact that there is no indication that a Pokemon box is full until it's too late is also ridiculous. Then there's the fact that Focus Energy tanks your critical hit chance, even though it's supposed to raise it? What about the fact that 100% accuracy moves can miss? That's the funny thing. Red and blue are full of flaws but I still come back to them every couple of years or so. Generation 1 keeps me coming back. I love how different it is at times. It's a simpler time. Before all those abilities, natures, mega evolutions, held items, it's Pokemon in its simplest form. Throw on all the bugs that are fun to mess around with, and we have a game that despite all of its issues, it still ends up being fun in the end. I still love Pokemon Red and Blue, 20 plus years later, and I personally give it a 6 out of 7. It may not be my favorite Pokemon game, but I would definitely play this again rather than anything post-Generation 5.